So welcome. Um, so my name's Matthias Baumert. Um, as you can see from the video, I badly need a haircut. Um, I'm a, a certified lab view architect, certified test and architect, and I'm not proud at all that I've actually managed to complete my first marathon a couple of weeks back. So uh, that's certainly not the reason why I inserted that on the title slide. Um, okay, let's let's get going. So the uh, presentation is about continuous integration and continuous deployment and how we can employ system link into that. So there's probably, I think, I aim for like about 20, 25 minutes of presentation, and then I'm going to give a practical demonstration. Just as a caveat, um, I've got three uh, virtual machines running on this machine at the moment. So if this computer dies, it's because of that. Um, <laughs> So hopefully, hopefully it's all going to go well. Okay, so let's get going. Um, let's start off with the Our Giants Are Female slide. Um, this uh, actually came from when my five-year-old daughter um, during Black History Month basically decided like, Daddy, you are my Black History uh, hero, and I said, Black History Month hero, and so like, no, I don't think that white male privilege does qualify for that. Um, so I actually looked up um, people that she can actually look up to. So Katherine Johnson is, I think, really, really right at the top there. So she uh, was a mathematician. She sadly passed away last year, uh, but she did live a very, very long and fruitful life. Uh, so she was a mathematician, black, uh, a black woman. So which obviously, in particular, back in those days, and even nowadays, um, the the amount of racism that she will have had to endure will have been horrific. Um, but she was selected by NASA as um, I think one of uh, three black females um, to yeah join the base their 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 space program. Um, as a mathematician, she was responsible for, in particular, to do calculations on trajectories of the space vehicles. Um, obviously, there were no computers back then, so that is why uh, these uh, roles were deemed uh, human computers. So obviously, this is nowadays, basically back then, this was really, really hard due to the absence of computers. Nowadays, this is all really easy obviously we can just use a uh, Kerbal space program to calculate our trajectories but uh, yeah basically in those days that there, there was a lot of work involved and I mean the the amount of responsibility um, is is insane um, so she was uh, involved in the moon landing trajectories for Apollo 11 which is obviously uh, one of the biggest feats um, that mankind in space managed to do in space uh, over the last century, um, but she was also responsible for the emergency re-entry trajectories for Apollo 13. So um, without her work, those astronauts would have not, not survived this. Uh, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2015, and yeah, I think she's an um, um, absolute fantastic example of um, what, um, what it means to get female talent into engineering. So let's um, carry on now with, with the actual presentation. So what we're going to look at is, um, I'm going to look a little bit at development processes. I'm going to look at how continuous integration can improve a lot of that, can reduce the cost, um, improve your mental health a lot. It's like, it's, it's really about getting the, um, the crunch time down at the end of, um, of a development cycle. And then how you can actually um, go further and go into like continuous um, deployment, uh, continuous delivery, continuous deployment. Um, those are very strongly linked, the two, but um, so looking at those and how we can use system link to, um, yeah, to, to, to close this gap from the continuous integration, like quite a few people have now done continuous integration and see the benefit, see the value, but then basically going on to continuous deployment. And obviously introducing a little bit what each of those terms actually mean. So software development process. Um, a lot of you will have um, had the joy of dealing probably with um, 
a waterfall model, which is kind of like you start off with the requirements, gathering, system design, architecture, module design, coding. Um, personally, I don't like the waterfall model because it really removes the ability of test-driven development on the one hand, but also just tests feed feeding back into the development process. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of a modified V, uh, which Laura will probably remember because that was the um, development process that uh, that we employed at uh, at uh, intelligent energy um, long 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 years back um, when when we worked there together so the um, the idea is here that you start off with uh, requirements gathering and you immediately think about like okay how can we actually test this you don't need to have all the answers here but you, it needs to have some good consideration because that immediately will give you some restrictions for how your system look, can look like. Um, again, once the system design is, is, when you do the system design, you need to think about how can we actually test this, which will have an impact on the architecture. At the architecture level, you really then need to start thinking about how can we integrate all of the different components and which will feed back into the module design. Module design will be covered by unit tests, and then you do the coding. And then at the, basically, and then you try to slowly walk back up. So you start off, you do the coding, you do your unit tests, unit tests fail, you go back to coding, your unit tests pass, you try to integrate everything, integration test fails, you write new unit tests to basically, um, to cover these failures, this passes now, so your integration is okay. And then you get basically to the system testing design and then acceptance testing. Um, at this stage here, acceptance testing, you really, this is a formality. At this stage, your system should be stable. Everything should be passing. It's about gathering evidence. So that is basically what's happening here. So let me just get back here. So. Let's have a look at what it costs to actually fix errors, problems at the various stages. So there's been some statistical analysis been done. Um, and if we, so if we look at this, basically, if you go in at the requirement stage, the cost is lowest because you can simply adjust your requirements. Um, when it goes into like coding unit test down here, the cost is already significantly higher because things might just turn out to be really, really difficult due to some constraints in the requirements. When we then go up into the integration testing, um, again, out of a sudden, we are getting closer to release deadlines, so which means we're probably going to anger our customers if out of a sudden we have um, big, uh, big problems cropping up. Um, and it's simply going to increase the cost then at the beta test program, which is going to be here in the systems testing, because at this stage, you should have something which is fairly stable. Um, again, cost will increase. And when we've actually pushed it over the fence uh, into production, um, the cost rises dramatically. Now, the problem basically is when looking at the cycle of uh, a life cycle of any kind of bugs which have been introduced into our code um, in a normal development process which does not employ any kind of continuous integration any kind of continuous deployment um, what normally happens is that we do a lot of coding up front and we do the testing at the end so which means we might go into the release phase um, which probably like think four to six weeks something like that uh, and that's when we figure out like all the little bugs so the problem here is really basically long time between check-ins we are not running the tests thoroughly every time uh, the tests are not good and um, we do not have any kind of uh, consolidation of our analysis results, which would help us to actually systematically um, hunt these bugs and get them out of our code. And the problem is basically, is, is yeah, 
is, is the human. What, what we are asking for here is really, really dumb, repetitive tasks. So really uh, tedious, repetitive tasks. So, and that's just not what us engineers are made for. We are trying to solve the problems. We're not trying to do the same thing over and over and over again. In, in any way, basically, it's we try to be efficient and not do the same thing over and over again. We're trying to automate these things. So what we really want is something. So, oh, yeah, um, going back basically one slide. So the problem with this is the reason why this basically costs so much money as well to fix is if you've introduced a bug and then three months later you figure out you have actually made a bug now you have to do the context switching get back into the frame of mind like what like yeah the code is documented like yeah our code is documented C come on we, we we do code documentation so our code is documented um but what was i exactly thinking when i actually did that like all this like you just need to be um in the swing of things you need to be in the frame of mind and three months later, it just means you kind of have to work yourself completely back into that as if it was as if it was a completely as if you were touching someone else's code. So what we really want is we want to introduce a bug and we want it to get basically filtered out the same day. That state at that state, you are basically we haven't committed to any kind of release deadlines yet. Um, and we can immediately fix it. We're still in the frame of mind. It really um, it speeds things up and um, reduces the redundant work at the end of the day. So going back to the first model, if we are now looking at uh, traditional development, we are looking at um, uh, basically, if you look at the code defects, obviously at the analysis point, we don't have any kind of code defects in there because there's simply nothing there. Um, so we analyze, analyze, we design, we implement now, we introduce loads of bugs, then we do the testing and right at the end, we basically get our release. Now, in an agile de development, um, this gets already improved quite a bit so agile development we basically set ourselves goals for two to three weeks um, we analyze design we implement them we test them so we do implement obviously some bugs during this and then we uh, we we fix them and then at the end of the three weeks we have a potential release candidate that's the idea and the incremental value is now actually visible throughout the development process that's at least the idea so how can continuous integration help us then? It can close the loop between the developer and the testing. So we have our developer, he checks in, he or she checks in um, uh, our, the code into source control. We build it, it gets automatically tested. We get some report back, some quality scores. And then by the end of it, we have a potential release. So in a continuous, um, delivery or continuous integration environment, we now get much, much more um, steady improve of our um, of, of the value, but also the code quality should never go down that much because you introduce a bug and you should immediately get warned about it. So how does that work? So we need to automate a lot of basically this testing and this building. So how does that work? Um, so what we generally we generally call these things pipelines in uh, continuous integration. So we have we we're creating a pipeline where we uh, when triggered a pipeline will basically take the source code that we've put into our source code repository. It will do static code analysis. So that is for LabVIEW. That would be the VI analyzer for test stand. That would be the sequence analyzer. Then we run unit tests um, for LabVIEW. We can use the unit test framework. We do our builds and then we publish the artifacts. The other thing that we get out of this is um, we are getting actual um, metrics here. We're getting told there are errors in your code, uh, static code analysis. So that can be anything harmless from 
um, you're not actually adhering to the coding style, style guidelines, um, but it can be more sinister. So for example, if you go to unit tests, um, if, if a test failed, that probably means there is a bug in there. So you get a history of the bugs as well in your continuous integration environment. And um, for, for each bug, so which basically means you can, the team can easily uh, keep track of what's going on there. We are getting the build health, which is basically like pass rates, uh, the duration, um, but also, as I said, like static analysis, unit tests, um, those type of things. So from a continuous integration point of view, how does this look now? So I'm doing my development on my computer. Yes, I'm going to probably do some, some type of manual building on my computer to verify it's kind of all working. Uh, I'm probably not going to bother running the unit tests on my local computer because I know this is going to be handled by my continuous integration environment. And to be honest, I couldn't be bothered anyway. So I'm now pushing something in. So for example, Atlassian Bitbucket or GitHub or Subversion or what, whatever you, Mercurial, what, whatever you prefer. And then that automatically kicks off Jenkins or there is obviously on uh, the Azure, uh, there's yes, the Azure tools that you can use. Uh, Jira, I think has some, um, some, some continuous integration. Um, uh, integration, yeah, continuous integration, integration. That's that's a, that's a nice one. Um, Im implemented as well. So first thing that we can do now is we can analyze our requirements. So uh, we can connect to doors. We can use requirements gateway to actually check what is the coverage of our um, yeah, what, what is the coverage basically of, of our requirements in our code? Now, this is a really fantastic metric. Um, it helps you as the developer, to, if you do this throughout, it helps you to uh, verify, like I have covered all the requirements. In particular, if you go like into the ADG market, like Aero Defense Government, where, where I've been working in for the last four years uh, and continue to work in as, uh, as part of my role uh, with NI. Um, so you have quite strict certification requirements, in particular when it comes like to the DO178, DO254, like the FAA requirements basically for any kind of anything that is actually going up in the air. So that's the one thing you you've got your your um, requirements coverage sorted there but the other thing is as well that it um, gives a very very nice report out to management they can actually see like oh you've covered now 70 percent of your requirements like our project is on track so requirements gateway um, have a look at it it's fantastic unit testing um, yeah, basically we can use the unit test framework for, for LabVIEW and get our unit testing done. We do our static analysis, so we do use the VI analyzer. We use the sequence analyzer to get that done. We can build any kind of executable or package or whatever. And then we can deploy this, for example, to some kind of standalone system, a continuous integration environment, where we can actually run these tests on a real unit and close the loop there. Now, this is all good and well. So you've now covered kind of like your development cycle, but how, what happens when you actually need to deploy this on a shop floor? And if you're a small startup, that's all not a problem. I think there is still good value in continuous integration. Um, but you can probably deal with a few test stations on, on, the, um, on the shop floor. That's not the problem. The problem is out of a sudden, if things start to scale up a little bit, so out of a sudden you have various configurations, you've got a large number of systems or even worse, you've got a large number of systems on various sites and you've got a huge amount of configurations. How do you deal with that? This is just, this is not a problem where you can just take a USB stick and go on the shop floor from station to station and basically put the latest software on. Um, you will simply run 
stale tests, like old tests basically on units. It, it creates a big problem where you might run into issues where at the end of the day, you might have to do a recall of a product because you actually figure out like, um, yeah, we tested those products, but actually those are those tests were, um, yeah, the, the, basically we knew at the, that point already that there was a big problem with the test and there were like false, false passes coming out. Um, nightmare situation. So the development, the, the deployment part becomes out of a sudden really, really important. So and this is where I kind of like want to introduce uh, or want to talk a little bit about System Link. I mean, System Link has been out now for a few years. Um, a lot of you will have heard about it. Um, so just I'm not going to give like an in-depth introduction. Um, I'm trying to make this fairly quick so that we can get onto our demo. So when talking about system link, it feels a bit like Morpheus trying to explain to Neo what the matrix is, because um, it's the, the way that I would describe it, it's the glue that can just stick together your engineering and your production, um, because it just does so many things. So you can do the systems management where we, um, where we can like do health management, basically of our systems, which uh, like, um, memory, CPU load, that type of stuff, um, what, what, what units are running, what, what software is deployed on which machine I can push uh, software to my machines, those type of things. We can do asset management. So we can do um, look at our test equipment. So compact Rios, uh, PXI systems, but also external tools. You will need to do a little bit of development if you want to, um, if you want to have your Agilent power, uh, power supply or uh, um, function generator um, in, in that, but it's, yeah, you can definitely do that. Um, and that can then look at like, when's the, when are my um, calibrations due? Um, those type of things. Data management, um, it can really help you to basically consolidate all your test data in a central location, which can then be used, uh, for example, with di a diadem to analyze your data. And then you can do test management. You can actually kick off tests remotely. So the only thing that we are going to look at today is the systems management, really, the software deployment. Um, the main reason for that is because System Link server is actually quite resource hungry. Um, if you wanted to run all of the services, you actually need uh, 32 gigabytes of RAM. And I'm, as I already said, I am already running here now um, three virtual machines on my mach uh, on on this computer, and it's nearly killing it. So I've reduced it to the bare minimum. Good. So let's carry on here. Uh, come on. So the system link architecture is server based. We have um, client, basically client server based. We have a system link server, which does all the thing. That doesn't mean that all the data needs to live on the system link server, as long as the system link server knows where to put any kind of data. Um, there's can be a, a separate machine and should be a separate machine. Um, you don't want to um, yeah, basically have a single point of failure. And then you've got your clients which connect to the system link server and then you can administer everything um, from that. Um, let me just write, okay, so here we go. We, so, and that brings us basically to the next step, like the continuous deployment side of things. Um, we we started off with basically having our code checked into source code re, um, re, uh, source code control. Um, so Bitbucket is just an example. Um, Jenkins gets kicked kicked off. Is doing all our analysis. Is doing all our building and is running more testing and is pushing this to this artifact to repository. And this is where System Link comes in now. System Link can now be the middleman between um, our build and our deployed system on the shop floor. And there you can go into like a semi-automatic or semi-automatic or fully automatic deployment. Now, most people, if you talk about semi-automatic deployment as in like you push it here, and then you still have to click a button, you're generally call, uh, talking about um, continuous, uh, continuous delivery. 
Um, well, if it's fully automatic, you're talking about continuous deployment. Um, yeah, nitpicking, but there we go. So in generally, unless you have full confidence in all of this process, I would recommend doing it semi-automatic. So it still gives you the amount of freedom that you do not have to go down on, um, on the shop floor and do your manual deployments, um, but it allows you to Re uh, react very quickly so you can so for example what 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 would be a good um model for me would be i've done a build i've pushed it um basically to system link and system i'm now have one system on the shop floor which is agreed with uh, agreed by with the shop floor staff where we push the latest and greatest and then basically they use that excessively and if it works after say 10 units or so we push it out to the rest of the shop floor um, if you wanted to have it fully automatic you need to have a you have to you need to have some dedication within your company to support this because the most important thing out of a sudden is not your code in bitbucket anymore it is your pipeline here if the pipeline goes down the shop floor goes down or well, they will have to work with whatever they've got right now. But this is out of a sudden becoming like the linking factor to your shop floor environment. So you need someone who's at least dedicating um, uh, some time to maintaining these pipelines. So this is kind of like, this is one of the caveats, like if you wanted to go to fully automatic, you need someone basically that maintains the pipelines. So and this is getting like into the DevOps role. Normally, our lab view teams are not, not that big that you need a full DevOps role. It's like more like in, in uh, other software where, where that is becoming really important, but you really need to think about this. So remote device management. So that is what we are going to specifically look at in a second. Um, that is something which System Link is, um, it, yes, is, is, is very good at basically as I already said we can look at health monitoring like is the calibration due what type of software is installed um, those type of things and then we go to the yeah basically health monitoring kind of already said that like memory warnings which you will actually see in a second in my demo because as I've already mentioned several times I'm quite limited so last but not least um, this is just for reference, though this um, presentation will be available afterwards. Here are a few useful links. So the one thing that everyone is always talking about, um, I'm trying to bring this up in a mo moment. So there is a learning path on the NI education, which unfortunately sits behind a paywall. I wish it wasn't. Um, so you need an active service agreement to access that. But there is a learning path about continuous integration. And one thing that everyone there is talking about, like, Ah, yeah, you can um, you can uh, transform the VI analyzer output into something which can get natively understood by um, uh, by by any kind of continuous integration environment. But we won't do it here, right? Here is a package which can do that with a caveat that LabVIEW 2020 has broken it. Um, LabVIEW 2020 is, I think, now has introduced in the error messages, I think, markup, markdown, I'm not quite sure. It's basically like um, XML style text for like if some things are in bold or something like that. And that breaks that. Uh, I've got a, I've got a fix for that. I'll see if I can put a branch, if I can create a branch and actually push that out of there. But uh, if you're working with 2019, it will just work out of the box. Uh, and here's basically a forums thread which does that. For system link to push things into um, a repository, again, a caveat, uh, system link 2021 has broken it. Um, <laughs> so there is, um, uh, which is something that I'm working on with R&D at the moment to get that fixed. Um, there is this API, which again for system link 2020 is not going to work i've got a work around again i'm looking at creating a branch there to push that out there so that people can actually start using it again um when um yeah so that actually brings me to the end of kind of like the presentation so um when looking at um 
uh, at, at a LabVIEW project, um, you will have seen, let me just bring this up. Shouldn't be too long for this to load up, famous last words, because I had it already running quite a few times today. Uh-huh. <laughs> Good. Um, any kind of questions? Oh, right. Okay. So there is a question here about DevOps. Um, I mean, what, what is, so the question is basically, and I use DevOps internally. Uh, yes, yes, of course we will. Um, it's basically, and I is, um, uh, obviously a very, very big company, but for example, my previous company, um, so I worked at Abaco Systems. So that's a, uh, mil, uh, mil Aero. Uh, company, so defense company um, focusing on the mill aero market, um, which is creating like ruggedized computer systems. Now, that's a company which has a size of like 700 people. And the test automation team that we built up there, so for like the UK site, which has like about 350 people, it's like four people. So having like a dedicated DevOps person there is difficult. Um, so no, internally, um, NI is definitely going to use DevOps in particular for the big developments such as LabVIEW test end. But if you are basically looking at uh, some of the um, some of the customers that I'm supporting, um, they are they have a fairly small team to support um, to support their shop floor, and that is basically where you then need to uh, yeah where, where you need to really think about getting someone in with some DevOps experience. Does that answer the question, Leah? Oh, not sure if she's still there. <laughs> um, Jenkins is not a continuous integration environment, no. So Jenkins cannot do the, um, the building Running the um, running of unit tests, kick off uh, VI analyzer. Um, so, uh, uh, System Link cannot do that. So, you can use Jenkins, obviously, there are other solutions. I use Jenkins merely because it is um, it's free. So, if we, for example, here, have, um, so my lab view finally came up. So if I now actually have a look at this, have a look here at my package uh, definition. Oh, come on. Right, there we go. And you can see there is here in feed, basically the whole publish to system link feed. Um, if you're using System Link 2021, you don't need to try. It's broken right now. So the team is working on it. Hopefully, we'll get a fix uh, out for that uh, fairly soon. For System Link 2020, I think this should all be working without problem. Good. Okay. Now, the demo. We are now actually going to run a real, um, basically, the, the, whole life, uh, the whole cycle. So the components. We have a system link server, um, which is obviously headless. You don't need to log in. We have um, my build machine. I would have normally used to build uh, basically a virtual build machine as well. But due to the restrictions of my computer, this is just going to be my computer. We have here Jenkins, which can run obviously a Jenkins server, which can run on Linux, but it can also run on Windows if you feel more comfortable with doing it like that. Um, I generally, just due to the lower resource usage, um, run them on, on, uh, yeah, on, on Linux machines. We have a system link client where we're going to deploy the whole thing to. In the cloud, I'm basically I'm just created a free GitHub account um, where I basically have my um, some uh, a project. Basically, we have a, a sample project, and we've got shared libraries here which are getting pulled in as well. So in my project, um, 
you can see that we have here a Jenkins file. So the way continuous integration for, uh, for Jenkins works is it pulls everything down from source control and then looks for this file. And this file is then going to define basically what to do. It's like different stages. So running my requirements analysis, running unit tests, VI analyzer, sequence analyzer, building my packages and publishing it. So those things are all defined in source code, uh, in source code control, which is, um, which is something that I really like. So if your, uh, uh, if your continuous integration server goes down, you should still be okay. Uh, you should be able to recover quite quickly. So this gets pulled down basically by Jenkins. So we've got our project here, which is here my pipeline demo. Right, come on, come on. So what you can see is basically here, some of the things that I talked about, you get like warnings, wherever there is a blip, there's probably something that completely broke during my testing. <laughs> So were a few things basically, which, uh, which are still needed to implement. You can go here into VI analyzer warnings, for example. So at the moment I've just used the standard set, which you should always adapt to what your style guidelines are. And then we can see we've got here um, uh, two, two VIs which have problems. Um, and we can basically see what, what, what the problems are for those. Um, so here, for example, it then tells us the exact error message. And that's basically, and this error message is where in LabVIEW 2020, they decided to put certain words in bold. And unfortunately, the, the, the way this comes out is just completely breaking this uh, integration package. But yeah, I'm, as I said, I'm going to try to put something out there which fixes that. So just to kind of like give, um, give some impression. So we're now much later than I thought, but we should still be able to run through the demo now. So I can now click on build now. I could just obviously check in some code um, and then kick off like an automated build. So we see here now, it's now going to, it's doing the checkout, which is coming here to my local machine. That's going to take a bit of time. So once that is done, um, we go into the requirements analysis. Now requirements, oh, I need to put that requirements analysis. I need to put another package in the links uh, at the end. Um, requirements analysis, there is no uh, supported API for requirements gateway, but there is a, an unofficial unsupported one. So a few years back, I created a package which is um, posted on the decaf forums um, which uh, yeah basically which allows you to do requirements analysis um, in an automated fashion so this is running through now we should see basically this is getting called through labview um, so we should see requirements gateway pop up in a second here give it a moment the waiting game. <laughs> oh, good. It's failed. Demo effect. Run it through three times earlier. Let's have a look. I think it might just be a case of uh, run it again and it's going to work. It's just really trying to push the boat here with what I have here. Yeah, okay. Okay, so let me have a look. There's nothing open here, so I'll just try again. <laughs> I can quickly have a look basically where it is to see if, uh, if there are any issues there, but it should just basically be deleted um, after every run. So this is where it basically gets pulled towards. So it's getting pulled out of uh, source code control now. Let me just scroll down here. Yep, so it's getting, it has been pulled down now. 
Now, hopefully, this is going to work this time. Meanwhile, let me give you a bit of a tour of uh, systems link. Let me just see, is this, do I need to log in again or has it saved this? Come on, come on, there we go. No, no, it really doesn't like it now. Um, let me have a look why. Yeah, that might be a bit of a disappointment. I should have done what Shri is normally doing. Shri is recording a video, but I've just run out of time. So this, uh, so let me also have a look if there are any Yeah, I think this might be, uh, it, it might basically, we might not be able to do this part of it. So let's go into the system links bit. Um, so in system links, basically, if we go uh, up here, but basically we have here our system links client, which is at the moment, um, yeah, which, which is connected. So this is our client, which is basically here. We uh, can now go here to a package repository. Um, so I've got a continuous uh, deployment demo here. And if we look in there, we have my sample, um, my sample uh, packages here, which obviously we should have been, should be now by 19 because obviously this uh, should have just pushed it in, but obviously the demo gods were not, um, kind to me today. So if we now go onto our, onto our system, what we can see here is basically a half, um, come on. So first of all, view basically uh, deselect products only because um, your, uh, your package will not be a product, so it will not be visible. So first of all, in feeds, what you need in feeds is you need your, uh, you need to set, so you can basically add uh, feeds to, um, to, to your workstations like that. So from package repository would be, for example, my CD demo feed, but also from the um, ni.com downloads. So for example, if you need support for a certain runtime, then we can basically, yeah, NXGS if anyone needs that. Um, we can basically add uh, the, the feed for a certain runtime to this. So the way the feeds are uh, yeah, are designed in NI package manager and particularly on NI.com are that you have for a certain package, you basically have its own feed. So it's a little bit different than how it would prob uh, potentially, how it would be done um, in repositories in, um, in Linux, for example, there you have a feed for the whole repository. So here, for example, we have now the runtime that needed to get added. So uh, and our package manager, system link, they are all automatically there after you've installed the system link client. So now if we go to available, we see we have at the moment uh, version 16 installed and 18 is ready to, uh, to be there. So I can now just go here on upgrade, click next. And there is a way that you can also set it up that it will automatically update to the latest version. So if you really want to go down the continuous deployment side of things and make it completely automated. Don't ask me how though. I've just been assured by our application engineers that that's the case. Right, so here we've got the project. Yeah, it's basically checked. Uh, are there any dependencies which need to get installed? So for example, when you install it for the first time and there is no runtime engine, it will demand the runtime, uh, basically obviously that you install the runtime engine as well. Um, now, a caveat here is you need to make sure that all the dependencies, that their feeds 
are already included basically in the feed uh, in the feed lookup basically of your system. Otherwise, it will simply not be able to find, for example, a runtime engine. So, and if we do this now, we can install this. And I think this pretty much brings us to time. So, yeah, well, not demoing. Yeah, I don't, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's absolutely the demo effect is definitely. True. So there, I had quite a few demos at customers where it's actually went went quite okay. So um, let me just try again. <laughs> so, but it basically brings us to to time. Um, so it's now doing basically the install, and we can basically log in onto the system now as well to just quickly verify this. So if I just quickly log in here. So, but yeah, basically it brings us to the question part now. So, what questions are there? Um, yeah, basically, what what would you like to know that I haven't gone into? What would would you like me to go into a bit more detail about? Well, this is all not doing anything right now. <laughs> okay, so installation of the software has now succeeded. And as far as I'm aware, you can also select a bunch of your systems and basically push a um, push a package to all of them at the same time to make it a little bit easier. Um, now let's have a look at my, sorry, where was my virtual machine here? Uh, it's still trying to log in. Uh, there we go. No questions there. Well, in that case, let's actually have a look what, is the, what this is doing. Yeah, I know it's failed for a third time. This is so typical. <laughs> Let me just have another quick look at the um, at the error output to see if I can spot anything obvious there. But I think it's just probably one of those things, just reboot the machine and it's going to work. Obviously, we don't have the time for that now. So, uh, launched successfully. It, for some reason, decided that it can't connect to, to LabVIEW. Okay, let me just actually have a quick look if there is. Our system link and Splunk relatives up to some point. I don't know what Splunk is, to be honest. Uh, yeah, is, is Splunk something like Jira or? I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I've, I've, I haven't heard of it. Could you just, if you could, in, in two words, in one sentence or so, describe what Splunk is, I might be able to give a bit more of an answer to this. As the same user interface is meant to deal with logs. Um, more of an analysis thing. Thanks, Jörg. Much appreciated. Um, yeah, System Link is obviously in in itself is not that much meant as an analysis tool. It's basically as a is a data consolidation tool. It basically gets all your system data and management into one place. Uh, all your test data. Um, asset data. Um, so the analysis, so for example, if you look at uh, your TDMS data or something like that, you would need DRDAM, for example, to do this. Now, let me have a quick look here. Um, uh, what, what can I quickly check here? So if I just actually just yeah, it's not going to work, obviously, but if I just run this from the command line, why is it? Right, I, 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 actually, what I wanted to check is if there were any processes um, of LabVIEW, which were which I hadn't closed. So details, there's no LabVIEW processes left. So I'm not quite sure why, out of a sudden, LabVIEW doesn't like to listen on the VI server anymore. Okay. 
Right, so yeah, we are, I think, logged in now into our system here. So we can now, basically, we have our application. I don't think I've created a shortcut or, oh no, it's automatically, is it automatically done? Okay, this is, uh, yeah, there we go. Re yeah, so the example executable. So all this is actually, pretty sure I clicked it already. It's probably going to come up twice now. So all this is doing is basically just adding two numbers together and doing a bad job of it because what we can see in our, what we can actually see in our demo, if we go back a few builds where it was still working. No, come on. So if we go in here and look at the test results, we had um, unit tests and there was a unit test basically which was failing here. So if we look at this um, and actually have a look at this unit test, we actually see that it checks that those numbers are getting added together really. But, um, come on, this is the problem if you're trying to run a Windows VM of one core and two gigabytes of RAM. <laughs> It's not going to work very well. Um, so the uh, yeah, basically, the idea was obviously of this demo is that the um, numbers are not actually getting added together; they're actually getting multiplied. Um, so, kind of like proving the point. So, if we, for example, add here now three and three and put this together and uh, we obviously it's multiplied. So the, um, the the unit test obviously failed and the idea was then basically to go back and fix this and getting the unit test basically fixed at the same time. So that is basically bringing us to the end, I think, of the presentation. I have literally no hopes that uh, this demo is going to work. I can hit the button once one last time, but uh, the chances are pretty much zero. So are there any more questions? Um, if not, I think we can wrap this up. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Um, so I hope it was a little bit interesting, even though obviously all you could see at the end of the day was um, the wrath of the demo gods. <laughs>
and again, the basically how long does it run to take to run through? So it's basically part of it is um, uh, part of the question is um, what what type of uh, computer you have? I mean, basically, as as I've already said, I'm running this uh, this computer here run ragged right now. This is going to be really slow on on a decent on a um, purpose built built machine. This is going to run much much quicker. Um, on um, uh, so that's uh, but basically then the the size of the project uh, yeah but, uh, and also depends what you need to do for example if you need to do like FPGA compilation again if you have like a complex FPGA uh, yeah FPGA build that you need to do for like a flex Rio card you can easily spend eleven hours for a build like that but that again is something which is where CI becomes very uh, very interesting because you can do all kind, all kind of like your simulated a simulation during the day, and then at night time you have automatically a build prep prepared for you to test on on the real hardware the next day. Um, so yeah, it's really I think the the answer is like how long is a piece of string? There is no real answer. You can go. Um, very very large and the larger you go the more benefit you will obviously get out of it so we are now i think at the build stage and now we are publishing to system link so and if we go here now um again if we just refresh this here and available and refresh it and we should have our new package come up now so i apologize obviously it's eating now into the next uh into the next uh, presentation and let me just check yeah products only is so and we can see our 19 build is now available. I can now upgrade this. It doesn't matter on my client if I'm logged out or logged in. This is all basically done in the background to through like a, a systems account. And apply this and then it's going to do the install. And if a restart is required, it will automatically trigger that one. No, size is, no, it's basically, it's more like the other way around with size. It's like the larger it gets, the, the more benefit you get from it. So uh, it's definitely, uh, if you have a large scale project, in particular with multiple developers, um, it, it's really important to kind of like do these type of things. Um, it, it really helps. So yeah, and this has succeeded. We've got now the latest version basically on, on the machine. So, hey, that's... Uh, unexpected but managed to get through the demo after all even though i think two-thirds of the people didn't didn't see it but yeah thank you very much um that definitely brings us now to the end uh and i hope that you have a good remainder of the conference thank you very much